Okay, uh, let's uh, go ahead and uh, discuss a few things. As I've mentioned before, the SI sessions are running now according to the schedule. This will be up on the first screen every day, right in front of your nose. Um, and just, you know, go if you can. It's really, really helpful. Uh, today's session is at 430 over in classroom building one, room 320. And Shia will be ready. Uh, the, I believe, did anybody here go yesterday uh, session? Did did you guys get the homework sorted out? Because she didn't have access to the homework. But did you guys, did you get a fairly good handle? Okay. Now, I know a lot of you were um, a little bit nervous and um, unsure about uh, homework problem uh, number eight on homework five. So let's take a look at this one. And we'll just reinforce this one. Uh, and this is just a verbatim, you know, cut and paste. Uh, you are hanging on a ledge on a tall cliff 33.0 meters above the starting point of your climb. Okay, so this guy down here, there's the starting point down here. This, this little guy down there. Right? And then here's you, all right? And you've got a baseball. You toss a baseball straight upward. And so your initial position is 33.0 meters. So in other words, you're not starting like we did the other day with Caitlin at x equals 0 at time t equals 0. This one we're starting, you know, up at 33 meters. That's all right. You know, we can handle that because we have a good formula for that. Now, the question was, predict the coordinate y subscript f, the final position, at final time t equals 1.4 seconds after starting, with baseball initial conditions of the following, 33.0 meters initial position, and 2 meters per second initial speed vertically, v subscript iy. And for those of you that, you know, forgot, with these calculation problems inside web courses, the numbers change on a random set every time you make a different attempt. So this is my first attempt of the day this morning. Um, and in the, the red box up above there, it says t equals 1.4 second. That, excuse me, that is one of the, the numbers that changes. And this is the other one that changes. So you might have had 2.1 seconds uh, and uh, 4.00 meters per second for initial speed. All right, everybody had 33. I made, I could have made that a variable too, but I decided, no, let's just, you know, we'll just set that one at 33 static. And here's the formula. This is the formula to use. Um, it's the one that is embedded in the instructions at the beginning of the homework and also in the problem itself. And by the way, um, a student was asking me in first hour in morning lecture, and I may as well repeat it, Dr. B, how do you handle formula sheets for exams? And I know everybody's always interested in, you know, exams, and in particular, you know, getting formulas right and stuff like that. Um, and the answer is I don't usually give a formula sheet on exams. In fact, I haven't for a long, long time. What I normally do is... I write out a bunch, I write out the test and figure out what formulas we will need. You know, so, you know, we might need this one on the test. Uh, one half GT squared. Uh, you know, some other F equals MA, that's Newton's second law. Uh, and so I figure out what we need on the test. And then I make a set of uh, two or three matching questions, three or four. You know, four or five, five or six matching, you know, depending. And for each item, I'll give you, for instance, number one, two, and three. I might give you three different formulas or equations. And then you have to match each of those with options A, B, one of options A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, then the options A, B, C, and D and E might be, you know, the name of the formula or some kind of a concept. 
or like its definition or use it when you know and then you know and so you'll always be able to connect a formula to some kind of a concept so it's as good as a formula sheet but better because it's like a formula sheet that you earn you get a point that's one of the points that's a multiple choice item in fact it's the very first thing you do on each test and so you get points for recognizing a formula and as I've mentioned before I believe in this class it is not super um, it is not super effective to memorize I mean you're gonna know 9.8 meters per second squared because we use it all the time but and 3.14 you know that's pi because you use you've used it a million times but I don't want you to memorize stuff and also on the very first part of the test the cover page where you write your name and your PID and all that stuff uh, I'll also give you a bunch of constants of nature one of them being G 9.8 meters per second specifically be because I do not want you to memorize I want you to think it's a little bit tougher now on the formula matching all you got to do is recognize you don't have to mem memorize you just have to recognize so if you've studied you'll recognize them for the most part and you, you'll start off with four out of four five out of five you know if you know your if you recognize now if you don't come to class I'm not looking at anybody but if you don't come to class you ain't gonna recognize them then you're your SOL but if you come to class you're gonna recognize them right? and so it's a it's a much better way and it's a way for me to give you the formula sheet and then basically what you're doing is taking a formula sheet and adding notes to it and I give you the notes you know you just pick which one to add to which formula anyways it works out good and uh, so you, it takes pressure off you but then it allows me to put more pressure on you by giving you tougher questions and if I said if I had a test where you have to memorize everything and that's it you know that would be tough but my tests are tougher than that so anyways here's our formula let's plug in uh, with what we know um, and again we're using the minus sign to denote downwardness uh, in this case our initial velocity is upward two meters per second 2.00 uh, but I think some of you no, I don't think any, anybody had a negative initial velocity that would have been throwing the baseball downward okay which you could do you know you know but G is down downward it's a downward acceleration so I give the minus sign to it right there in those parentheses so let's look at what we got in this first let me get my cursor over here there we go in my first one here uh, that's the speed now the time um, V I Y is here in the first parentheses then the time whoa there we go okay there's the time time T 1.4 seconds and then here's the other one now this one over here on the right over here it's gonna get squared so it's in the brackets the square brackets and the square brackets in total are being squared okay now I'm not skipping steps and I know some of you guys are thinking come on dr. B let's get on with it you know I had calculus class this is baby steps for me but for a bunch of people in here no we got to go through the steps nice and easy and I don't mind doing that so here it is step by step we fill in the things and then we start computing all right so our next line is okay 33 over here nothing to do with that we'll, just, we'll wait with that. we'll just leave that as itself until the very last step um, now this one 2.8 that's 2 times 1.4 and the seconds cancel out so this second in the denominator and this seconds in the 
a numerator 1.4 inside the uh, bracket, inside the parentheses, excuse me, uh, those cancel. And you're left with meters, which is good. It's a position. So I should have some number of meters, which I do. Now, I'm going to get meters over here. Um, 0 0.5 times negative 9.8 is negative 4.9. So that's right there. But I still have that second squared in the downstairs of the fraction, the denominator. Uh, but it's going to cancel over here. Now, 1.4 quantity squared is 1.96. But it's 1.4 seconds quantity squared. So I have a 1.96 and then second squared. And that second squared cancels with the denominator uh, of this negative 4.9 meters per second squared. So I get meters here as well. Everything's copacetic. All right, let's keep going. So here's what I here's what I have. And this is my last multiplication. And you know, you can do this on your calculator. It's not like, you know, when I do it on my calculator on my laptop, it's not like, you know, you have to use calculus or anything. But if you use the memory, you can do this, you know, without having to write things down and stuff. But if you want to write things down, this is how you can do it one way. Okay, so negative 4.9 times 1.96, that's about 10 or something, or negative 10, and, it, and it, you know, estimating it, and it actually works out to negative 9.604. Now, one thing I want to point out to you, when I talk about three significant figures, that means the number of uh, numerals I have, no matter where the decimal point is. All right? Now, in this first term, I have three significant figures, 33.0 meters. Okay. Uh, and I have one uh, numeral in the tenths position. It's a zero. In the second term up here, in the first parentheses, 2.80 meters, there I have three significant figures, but the decimal point is uh, one notch to the left, and so I have two numerals in the decimal fractions area. All right, But now when I add those together, I lose that, that hundredths place here, and it's kind of sacrificed. But it's it it it, it the, the final computation is is here thirty five point eight. Now I got to do the same thing over here uh, with this baby nine point six negative nine point six zero four. All right. Now normally I won't even write that four, but for you guys I decide to you know leave it in there. Uh, but we're gonna cut it out. You know, so we we take thirty five point eight. We add a negative. 9.604, and uh, hey, you guys, uh, adding a negative is the same as subtracting. So if you're on a calculator, 35.8 minus 9.604, ding, and that'll get you to your, your answer. 26.2 meters positive. All right. Question, Colin. Where did I get 0.5 in the previous uh, slide? I got it uh, right there. Okay, from the one half in the one half gt squared. Yeah, I mean, so you, you know, it, there's a different ways you can, you know, do this. I'm not saying you have to do every step the way I do, but this set of steps is kosher if you want to follow this method. Two meters per second. That's in here. Remember, because we went two, 2 meters per second times 1.4 seconds, the previous slide. It's right in here, 2.80 meters. Because if you go 2 meters per second for 1.4 seconds, that's how far you go, 2.80 meters. Question. Okay, if you've got a neg some of the some of the variations of this problem, you come up with y subscript f a negative number. 
and that is kosher, it simply means you're somewhere below your, go- your, your partner, you know, the starting point. The ball's all the way past him. Now this one, this, if you think about it, this one, you're at 33 meters. So you're up here, the baseball at this, and you throw it up, and it comes down, and at 1.4 second, it's down here at 26.2, but your partner's down here, at, still at zero, so it's between you. But now if it's negative, it's below both of you. So, and this formula will handle all of that automatically if you're careful uh, with this minus sign. Okay, and, and actually, if you throw it downward, you know, like a water balloon, uh, then you'll have a negative number here, and you'll, you, you might get a negative um, uh, a number for y subscript f again, you know. So there's a bunch, it'll all, it, this formula will um, handle all those, okay. Another question, yes. Yeah, if you threw it downward, you'd have a negative number in here. You know, VIY would be like negative 5.3 meters per second. That means downward at 5.3 meters per second. And then you'd still have negative G, you know, 9.8. You know, so. so this formula handles all of that. If you can remember your minus signs and handle them carefully. Question. What you were given was initial conditions, Y subscript I, and VIY, okay, here and here. And you were also given T, the time of interest. And in this case, 1.4 seconds. But the, the time and VIY changed each time you took the the quiz, or the homework uh, object. All right, so you could, you know, so this one, the initial speed was two upward, but it could have been four or um, 5.2 or, you know, whatever, you know, the random number set, you know, spat out. Same with the time, 1.4, 4.2, you know, whatever. Okay, so. All right, now that you've asked some questions and hopefully you guys are really good, let's try another one on the eye clicker. Okay, so take your calculator out. And take your brain out. Dante, you ready? All right. All right, let's calculate. And you're up on the same cliff, but now it's your climbing partner that's up there. You know, you ascended to 33 and did the baseball trick. Now he's up there at 33, and he does it a little bit differently. Now let me start the question. Okay, and I don't think you have to hit the refresh button on this, but you do have to hit send. Also, be very careful in case you do come up with a negative sign, uh, a negative number. It's somewhere below, I don't know, where is it? Below the zero? Above the zero or below it? Below zero? All right, so the minus sign is in there uh, if you need it. All right. And in addition to that, here's my corny science joke of the day. Never trust an atom. They make up everything. That's no good. And while you guys are doing that, I'll try to calm myself down from my fiasco day. Good gravy. And it's not over.
us your name again? Stephanie, did you get the emails about meetings? Okay. About transcripting and stuff and captioning. You're supposed to be doing a meeting to today or tomorrow. But I haven't been able to check my mail since like 7 this morning. So. How am I doing? Am I talking clearly enough? Okay. okay. And you guys, when you're doing this, um, talk to your neighbor. Be free. You know, just double check it. Iron sharpens iron, they say. I got a monster on the way through engineering. Yeah. It's the only thing that kept me sane. I owe, I owe you like a, a case. Because that should have been me trotting back over there, not you. Yes. It's all right. You can walk in front of that. Here, let's see what you get. Come around over here. Yeah, let's see what we got here. Yeah. Man, these lights in here, it's so hard to see. Negative. All right, let's, let's turn it off. Go nitro. Okay, that's one. All right, now supposedly the. Okay, that's the negative sign, right? Okay, then you go here. Right? Okay, now you need the decimal here. Yeah, is that the? Is that it? I can't really see it. I mean, that's a dot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was the dot. Well, I don't know. Maybe did you turn it on before I started the question maybe? No, I actually had it off. Hmm. Yeah, I got it now. So you're good. All right. Welcome. Okay, 30 seconds. I want to the nearest centimeter, so I do want two, two decimal points. Hey, you guys, I didn't say three significant figures. I said nearest centimeter. So if you have a... A something, uh, something, point, something, something. Give me those point, something, somethings. And if you if you want, it, turn your computer back, turn your clicker back on, and and re-enter it. I'll I'll be able to get that check. To send in your right answer, and I'll get that check. Okay. And we'll, we're do, we're doing good. You guys are doing good. No no worries.
All right, 30 seconds. 30 seconds before you're terminated. You're always going to stick with what I tell you to, okay? I I I try to always specify what I want. Okay? So I'll always say give me once, you know, give me the nearest tenth, nearest point one or nearest point oh one. You know, I always specify that because it's, it's, it's a pain in the neck. Okay, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Oh, my goodness. You guys are geniuses. Seriously, look at this. The morning class got the correct answer, 84%. You guys, 85%. Sweet. So you guys are the genius section for today. Uh, and also, I noticed, uh-oh, four people typed in negative 24.8. No. I want 7.5. If I ask you for nearest centimeter, that means something, 24 point something, something. And I see a 24.75. You missed your minus sign. I'm sorry about the clickers. They're very tough to read, even with the lights on. It's, you know, like the decimal point's really small. Nothing to do about it. You just got to use your x-ray vision. Anyway, here's the correct answer, negative 24.75. And so I hope you feel a little bit more confident now uh, ab about that. Good. So we can have that, the whole test. Problems like this? Okay. All right. All right. Now, last time we talked about Galileo's comments on acceleration, and I was talking about it a little bit to start class. Um, you know that he his criterion for truth was that whatever he's talking about has to be something from nature. What is that? Is it raining out? Oh boy. I thought it was somebody roller skating across the roof or something like that. Okay, so anyways, Gal shh, 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 shh. Galileo. He made a strategic choice, a lovely choice, a happy choice that pays fruit to this day of using free fall as the prototype for all accelerations. His criterion was that if he makes a claim, it has to be verified by experiment, and it did, according to Galileo, something that Aristotle would not have thought about, as smart as Aristotle was. His idea of acceleration was that it was a, a it described an object, the state of motion of an object that it was continually acquiring new increments of speed. For free fall, 9.8 meters per second more speed for every second of free fall. And if it's, if it's a constant acceleration, it repeats itself always in the same manner. Now, free fall is like that. It's a constant acceleration. And everywhere from the top of Mount Everest to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, it's 9.8 meters per second squared downward. Now, if you go out into space, it's a little bit weaker. And so on, but um, but not all accelerations are constant. For instance, if you're in a car, you accelerate from the parking lot backwards, then you stop, then you accelerate forward, and then you turn right or you turn left to get out of the parking lot, and then you head for home or wherever you're heading. And when you get home, you stop. You, you pull into your parking spot and you stop. That's a bunch of accelerations and decelerations, and that's not a constant. But gravitation, the, the free fall, is a constant. So it was very good that he took that, um, that view. And now we talked about all that last time. What we're leading up to is his accomplishment with respect to projectile motion. Now, in his day... The late 1500s, early 1600s, 
the technology they had was muskets and cannon. So they had cannons, you know, naval cannons and terrestrial, you know, ground forces cannons, and they had muskets and stuff, but that was about it. But they, they definitely wanted to know where the cannonball was going to go. Now, if you're in the Army today and you're in an artillery unit, you can put, easily put a round into this classroom from 5, 10 miles away, depending on the artillery piece that you're using. And it's easy. As, and, and those guys have to know all about this parabola. Right? This is a, a parabola. And th I believe this image is, is also in your e-text. Now, Galileo is the one that figured it out. You know, previous to that, everybody knew that the the projectile curved it didn't go in a straight line but nobody could you know figure out exactly what it was okay Galileo figured it out it's a par parabola parabola all right and we're going to take take a look at that this is what he did to figure out exactly that it is a parabola so he thought of uh, something going on a flat plane and I'm going to use the terminology of a cliff with a Ferrari on top of it, a perfectly flat cliff. So the top surface could be the y-axis. And you're driving a Ferrari along at 20 meters per second, parallel to the x-axis. Now, Galileo was definitely thinking of an idealized uh, flat plane with, without friction. Okay, now if we had an idealized flat plane, and a Ferrari with no friction, and a plane with no friction, then we could turn off the engine once it reaches 20 meters per second, and then it would keep going at 20 meters per second on that hypothetical uh, frictionless plane. And so that's kind of what we're thinking about. Now, it gets to the edge of the plane, and so we can think of that as the Ferrari driving to the edge of the cliff, and keeps going. So here's what Galileo said. When this thing goes past the edge of the cliff, you start your clock. And as you start your clock, you also start to drop. And Galileo said this, and this is something that Aristotle would not have said. As you go... All of that horizontal motion that you had on the top of that, that flat surface on top of the cliff, you keep all of that because there's no horizontal forces. Gravity is only downward. It's not horizontal. You know, like these Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know, there's, there's no such thing as horizontal gravity. Well, that's, you know, that's what Galileo's banking on here. There's no horizontal gravity, so you just keep all, whatever you had, you keep it. That was the thing that Aristotle would not have said. And he said, so, so go ahead and sketch out to the right here a few of these little arrows uh, over here and make them all the same size. You keep all of that. All right? There's no forces. So if you had it over on top of the cliff, you keep it. All right? But once you clear the edge of the cliff, you also get some of this you get a little bit of downward speed. Now, as you go downward, you get more and more speed. So make these arrows different length. Okay, this first arrow up here, that's a short, fairly short arrow. And this one down here is a little bit longer. And this one down here, not only is it longer, but it's, fr it's further down the, the pipe. It's further down the cliff because you're moving faster. Now, these arrows up here, the horizontal uh, vectors, uh, those are the same. They're evenly spaced because there's no such thing as horizontal gravity. So you just keep horizontally wise, you just keep chugging along. Now, what Galileo said is, all right, if I incorporate drop distance, one half GT squared for the vertical component, and we have that formula. That's the one we had for homework five. So Galileo said, okay, we'll use that one for horizontal. And then we'll just use uh, distance equals speed times time for horizontal. For this one up here, distance or x equals speed times time. 
V-I-X times T. <coughs> Ding. And when you do that, mathematically, you get a parabola. Now, I'm not going to derive all of that. But yes, that is a parabola if you combine both of them. And Omari, this is, this is the part up here, these equal arrows. That's the part that, you know, Aristotle would, would have said, Galileo, you get, get out of here. Get out of town, Galileo. Get out of Athens. You know? And Galileo saying, no, I got it. You get out of town, Aristotle. Get out of, Aristotle, you're a good guy. You're smart, you, but you're not an Italian. You know, and we got, here in Italy, we got a, and here's his strategic conjecture. The Galileo put applied in order to figure out his strategic concept of projectile motion. You know, he worked for one of the Dukes of Venice, I think, of the Duke of Venice, something like that. A very important guy, and they had warships, and they so they all wanted. They had armies, navies. They all wanted to know how cannonball uh, operated. So here's, so he said, I can I can figure that out now. I think. And this is the strategic part of his conjecture. If no force is acting horizontally, there's no change in the horizontal speed. So if you're up here on this on this horizontal plane, you just keep cruising along. I mean, hypoth hypothetically. It's an idealized plane. If you factor in air resistance, then no. But if, if you're thinking ideally, and that's okay to do, you know, ideally speaking, you know, the, air, the artillery units for the Army, they start with a parabola, and then they add in a little bit of aerodynamic air resistance to really, you know, they get that squared away, and then they can put it within inches of where they want. It's really amazing what they can do. And that was 30 years. I had a, f a friend of mine 30 years ago that was in the Army. He said, yo, we were sitting in the faculty lounge eating lunch or something. He said, yeah, we could, you know, we could, we could put a round right in this. The coffee room was about the size of, you know, it wasn't that big, maybe half the stage up here. He said, oh, yeah, and that was 30 years ago. I don't know what they can do now. Of course, they got GPS munitions now, so forget about it. They could put it, they could choose the different seats that they want to put around it. So if you're on their targeted list, that's it doesn't matter where you sit they can get you anyway so here's uh, here's Galileo's conjecture and this is the one Aristotle would never have agreed to uh, but Galileo was able to do it precisely because he had done experiments with inclined planes so he was fooling around with inclined planes just like we were you know trying to measure the motion Matty and you know, you know, they figured out speeds and accelerations and all that jazz. And he said, you know what? I think on an ideal horizontal plane, it, it's not going to take any force to keep something going. Now, what Aristotle would have said, no, if you're if you're moving at a constant speed, you've got to have something that's pushing you along. You've got to have some push force behind you. That's what Aristotle said. And Galileo said, no way, Jose. No way, Aristotle. All right, now, here is what we've got to tackle. The key concept. How much of the gravitational pull of Earth, you know, 9.8 meters per second down, straight downward, how much of that do you actually get when you're on the ramp? I mean, you don't get all 9.8 meters per second squared if you're on the aisle here. You get some. And Stephen was really, you know, going. And Colin, when they were here, they were they were motoring by the time they got down here. But they they weren't accelerating at 9.8 meters per second squared. So the key concept is, okay, here's your here's your acceleration here if you're going straight downward. But how much do you get if you're up here on the ramp? Okay. Now Galileo could savvy that, and we're going to savvy that by doing a little bit of geometry and a little bit of right triangles. Because what he found is it depends on the tilt angle, basically. And if you do a little bit of trigonometry, which we're going to do here, 
some similar triangles, proportional triangles is basically it, right triangles. Uh, you can savvy this, and it's going to establish the fact that he could do this on a ramp means that he could demolish Aristotle, who said, no, you have to have a force to keep something going at constant speed. Galileo was saying, no, you need no force at constant speed on a hypothetical horizontal plane, frictionless plane. So let's get started with this. Now, here's, here's a downward pull, pull of gravity, vector w. All right, and here's u holding it upward. You have to exert the same amount of upward force, and if they balance, you can, you know, you know, so, you know, so if you have a rope, it's got to be able to hold up whatever you're trying to hold up. So if you have a little bit of rope, you can hold up a bicycle, but you can't hold up an elephant. All right, the string will break, the rope will break. But you know, supposedly, if you, if it, if you've got enough strength, or your rope is strong enough, you can supply as much upward uh, force as gravity from Earth is producing downward. All right. Now the question is. All right, that's for straight up and down motion. How do you figure it out for this? What do you have to provide uphill, up the ramp, capital letter U, in order to keep this thing from going down the ramp? So over here, if you want to keep this thing from falling, you've got to provide capital Y, that upward push force, or you know, like from a rope, a pull force, upward to counteract gravity's downward pull. So here's, here's what you've got to do if you're on a ramp. You've got to provide some force up the ramp, uphill, but you don't have to provide all of this. Now this right here, you don't have to, you know, if, if that's your object, if you're on a ramp, you don't have to provide, you know, so you don't have to be Arnold if you're on a ramp. All you got to do is like, just like a normal person here. Providing a little bit of force, you. All right, now how do you figure that out? Well, here's how you do it. You take your physical ramp, the gray ramp, and then you make a copy of that triangle, exact same shape, and you call it an acceleration or a force triangle, and you make the hypotenuse of your copy you say to yourself, all right, I'm going to make that the same size as my gravitational weight force. Because remember, here's, the, here's W here. There's the straight down vector. So if you copy this triangle and say, all right, I'm going to consider the hypotenuse to be W, then take this little teeny, the little teeny side of the triangle, and rotate it so that it's right here parallel to the surface of the ramp, okay? That's, that part of the yellow triangle is the amount of force that is going down the ramp. And that's letter D. Boy, this is a storm. If you can hear it, if you can hear the thunder in here, woo. Maybe we should just have like a five-hour physics class <laughs> for safety. No? Okay. Yeah. Now, some of the acceleration, you know, W is the entire acceleration. If you're going straight down, W is your acceleration vector. But if you're, if you're going along the ramp, this is all you get. That's it. You just get a little pokey amount. And the rest of it is absorbed, capital A. All right? So here's another way to look at it. Um, here's U pushing up the ramp. That's the, that's the vector U that I had diagrammed up there. That's what you have to provide going up the ramp. And here's what gravity provides going down the ramp. All right? And this yellow triangle is the same shape, different size of the actual physical ramp. So we could do one for this. You know, if I figured the, the, the length of this ramp and how much elevation it gains, we could do the same thing here. Might be interesting to do. 
Now, I'm going to go over this set of text here at the bottom of the screen. I'll go over that on Thursday. What I want you to do is tackle homework six tonight. I'll have it up by supper time. And then I want you to read chapter two um, and then into the laws of motion in chapter three. Because Thursday we're going to talk about chapter three. Okay, you're dismissed. And thank you for your patience at the beginning of class.